Welcome to the Hay Kings Podcast, sponsored by Vermeer, your expert in hay and forage equipment. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by Andrew Eddy. Andrew is the president of the Washington State Hay Growers Association. He also farms near Moses Lake, Washington. He's an alfalfa, Timothy, uh, orchard grass grower. Is, did I did I cover all the crops, or are there more? Yeah, there's a little sliver of corn jumped in there, but that's about forages is the main uh, main venture. Gotcha. Now, the Washington State Hay Growers Association has an event coming up, the Northwest Hay Expo. Do you want to tell us about that? Yes. The Washington State Hay Growers Association puts on an annual conference in Kennewick every January. This year, it is January 18th and 19th. It's a day and a half event. We cover topics ranging from logistics to markets, whether that be fertilizer, fuel, hay markets and things like that. And then we'll also cover crop nutrients and crop health throughout the event. It's a great networking event that we try to craft and tailor to our audience, both in the Columbia Basin, the Northwest and beyond. We'll have attendees from Idaho, Oregon, a little bit from California, maybe Colorado, Utah, things like that. So, and up into Canada. So it's a really good event, Uh, covers a lot of topics that we're excited to present every year. I was looking at wa-hay.org, so that's wa-hay.org, and you can find all the information for this, including the, the hotel information, so if you want to book a hotel, you can find that there. But I was looking at the expo exhibitors list, and it looks like there's around 55 different exhibitors coming. Tarp manufacturers, I see exporters, I see a bunch of equipment manufacturers. It's a it's a pretty diverse group, isn't it? It is, yeah. We have a lot of industry professionals come in, showcase what they have to offer. There's a very big trade show, a bunch of breakout sessions that kind of helps showcase that the industry is involved with the forage profession and the ways that they're moving forward with both equipment and products to help make our job as forage growers easier um, and more efficient year after year. So there's a lot of participation, especially from the industry. It is the biggest trade show for strictly forage here in the Northwest. Um, and I'd say even beyond that, kind of up on the West Coast. I mean, it's... It is just a hay show, right? Yes, it is strictly just just a forage show. So that makes it a lot easier to kind of direct and craft the program and presentations and the industry professionals that we have here for this show. It makes it pretty easy to just focus on one thing and go from there. It's very it's very specific. It's a very good networking event for everybody involved. They get to see people that maybe they don't know of or don't talk to all that often besides the show. So it brings a lot of ideas and collaborative ideas into this industry. Now, I've attended several times, and humbly, I'm on the the agenda here. So I'm very much looking forward to this. This is one of my favorite events of the year. For sure. Again, we can uh, summarize here. This is January 18th and 19th at the Three Rivers Convention Center in Kennewick, Washington. And if you'd like more information, including where to get a hotel, and and now the program's not quite up yet, but it will be shortly. You can go to wa-hay.org. That is correct. Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend whenever you're listening to this, I would recommend if you're going to go, you might as well book it right now. Um, the hotel that's attached to the convention center fills up pretty quick. There is, I think, three other hotels right in the same area around um, the convention center that you can book hotels at that are of good quality. So, if you uh, if you're even slightly bit interested in coming out, I would recommend it. It's a very good show. I think that the board, to speak kind of humbly, I think the board does a great job of bringing in presenters and talks that are relevant and engaging. So I think moving forward, you know, if you're if you're interested, it's definitely something that you need to attend at least once, see what you think, and if anybody has any ideas for further shows and things like that, feel free to. Uh, Come out and get involved. We need more. We need more people involved, especially grower-wise, 
in our association on our board. So it's a good thing to be involved in. You know, everybody's involved in, say, Farm Bureau or the Hay Growers, you know, Association, Potato Commission, things like that. Everybody's involved with their certain thing. But if you're growing forages, I definitely think it's something to be be cognizant of and be involved in because it we do try to make a difference inside of both the political landscape and the industry landscape to try to make sure that we're doing everything we can to grow bigger and better with our growers in mind for what we're what we're kind of advocating for. This is a little bit unique. You've traveled the country and as of I and we mentioned that this is the biggest pure hay show in the country. It is. And you've talked about the board, the uh, the Washington State Hay Growers Association Board of Directors. That hay association is kind of unique, too. It is, yeah. It's, uh, it's people from all across in the Columbia Basin, different areas of the county and things like that, even down into Pasco, Tri-Cities, up into Spokane, up into your area where you're at. It's a wide diversification of operation sizes, efficiencies, crop plans, growing conditions, ground. It's it's nice to be able to get together with a cohort of different minded people, but also having the same goal of promoting the ag industry and the forage industry specifically to grow bigger and better and do things that are of benefit to our growers while providing information, resources, and also a voice both on the political landscape and, like I said, in the industry where we kind of have a collective of people that are prominent in the forage landscape that can come with, you know, many years of experience or just a few to bring all of those thoughts and processes together to help build, um, build us up and also help our growers with making things better for them to kind of keep growing into business and make sure that we quote unquote, don't get forgot about, you know, we're not, we're a big crop. You know, we're number three for alfalfa. You mean hay and forage is the third largest crop in the U.S.? I just want to put yes. an exclamation point on that. Bigger than wheat. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you look at the big five and we get, you know, we get kind of shoved under the rug, I guess, so to speak, for lack of a better term, on funding, on research, on uh, recognition for what we actually do. So making sure that we are pushing forward with that and showcasing exactly how much we do in the industry and in the whole landscape of the entire country is huge. So we're just trying to make sure that we're continually moving forward and making sure that people kind of start adding some recognition to it. The biggest challenge, especially for us, is since we're not a direct-to-consumer product. We're a direct-to-consumer pets product, essentially. <laughs> right. Um, or direct-to-dairy or direct-to-feedlot, yeah. Yeah, we're kind of a kind of a back, you know, a back ways of like, hey, well, I don't eat hay, but my animal eats hay, or the cow that I ate tonight for dinner, you know, this steak was raised on hay. So it's like we're not a direct-to-consumer, but we're a direct-to-a-consumer's stomach, so to speak, I guess. That's one of the biggest things to try to get into people's heads. And I think that's where the big kind of hiccup is because we're not direct. We're directly affecting human consumption, but we're not directly affecting somebody's ability to eat. We're not direct so, human consumption. That that distinction yes. ends up being really critical as we think about our voice out in the marketplace, For sure. right? For sure. Andrew, thank you very much for joining us. We're actually going to go over and talk to Kevin Gray. He was one of the founders of the Washington State Hay Growers Association, and as it turns out, the Idaho and Oregon State Associations as well. So here's a history lesson as to how we got the Washington State Hay Growers Association and uh, the Northwest Hay Expo as a result of that, but, but so much more. Thank you again, Andrew. Yeah, of course. Let's take a break there and we'll get a word from our sponsor. From the hay field to the feed bunk, look to Vermeer. You've got livestock to feed. You know about our lineup of mowers, rakes, and balers. Now we're taking our legacy to the bunk. Introducing the Vermeer lineup of vertical mixers and feed wagons. 20 different makes and models to fit your operation. Durable, long lasting components and accurate scales with Bluetooth capability. From the field, to the feed bunk. 
look to Vermeer. For more information on Vermeer, you can check out vermeer.com forward slash haykings. Kevin is one of the founding members of the Washington State Hay Growers Association, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Hay Expo, the origins of the Hay Growers Association, and some of the things that the hay growers have done that have made a meaningful difference in the industry. The question that I started out with today was when did the Washington State Hay Growers Association start having a conference? But what you just told me is that you were doing a conference, Grant Adams Group or the Benton Franklin Group before that? The Benton Franklin Group. The, the Benton Franklin Group before that. When yes. did that start? Around 1985, I bet. Oh, okay. So now we're talking... Okay, that makes sense. We started having the conferences, 85, 86... The state hay growers came together in 86. That's when the Articles of Incorporation are, are from. Yeah. And then you started adding chapters on after that. Correct. Gotcha. Tell me about this reaching out to Idaho and Oregon again. So what we decided that we needed groups in our nearby states to go ahead and be as strong as they possibly could be. So we went ahead and set a group of four farmers from Washington down to Oregon and talked to one of their county groups down there and encouraged them to go state. And then we also did the same thing over in Idaho. Idaho actually started before Oregon did. With a state hay growers association. Correct. Correct. This this all feels so new and recent to me. I'd imagine if you look at the the National Soybean Association, it's considerably older. Yes. Why was Hay so late to the game in getting these state organizations? Because it seems like the alfalfa growers were a lot more independent, and the way we go ahead and market our product is so independent. Mm -hmm. Having a statewide association, just there never was a thought to do it that way. But what we were finding out there in the late 80s was we needed some help with statewide legislation to go ahead and fight for our way of life. And so we went ahead and felt like we needed a statewide association. When we went ahead and started a statewide association, we also started a legislation arm to go ahead and try to influence what was happening at the state level as far as protecting our rights. This strikes a particular chord with me because I, I was just down in Southern California for the World Alfalfa Congress, and we were talking to some of those guys in the Imperial Valley talking about exceptionally senior water rights. But the, the cities are coming after the water, trying to force uh, really our, all of our leafy green salad mix production uh, out of business eventually. But hay plays a big part in that, too. So what, what you're talking about is farmers getting together to tell a good story, to go and uh, I hate talking about lobbying, but that's re really what you're doing when you're telling your own story to a politician. You're not lobbying in the suit and tie sense, but telling your story to, to make sure your industry is understood when it comes to legislation. That was exactly our thoughts, is we needed some representation from the hay growers to go talk to our state representatives to go ahead and try to help us out. And this is... So having several state associations in the West could help us work through water issues, port issues, all of which we've had, right? Yeah, exactly. We went ahead and started out statewide, and after we went ahead and more or less lobbied statewide, after about three or four years, we decided we needed the local states to go ahead and help us go back to Washington, D.C. And early on, we did send some legislation, uh, some lobbies, like, to legislate and help back in Washington, D.C. So what you're talking about is hay growers doing the same kind of work that you would expect a farm bureau to do. Exactly. What we started and farm bureau stepped in and now our local, local state organization backs what farm bureau is doing. But we were actually doing it before farm bureau was. <laughs> And we actually got some hay growers on Farm Bureau, uh -huh. and they went ahead and took over the brunt of what we were doing. 
So working in conjunction with maybe a broader coalition of agriculture, right? Yes. I don't know. I think it was fairly effective at the time. And like I said, we were noticed enough. Farm Bureau took up the fight for us. That's pretty cool. As a board member for the Washington State Hay Growers, I'm wondering, I, fi- I find myself like loving this history and wondering if we've done a good job of maintaining that relationship with the Farm Bureau. And in my mind, maybe that's something to work on again. Huh. Actually, those guys that went ahead and started, the they were part of the Adams Grant County. Mm-hmm. A couple of those guys went on into Farm Bureau and went fairly high up in leadership in Farm Bureau. Oh, okay. And that's more or less how that pipeline continues to go ahead and help farmers out is because they understand what the hay farmers need. Now I'm understanding why folks like Joel Olmsted still go to the Farm Bureau meetings. Yeah, Farm Bureau has done a really, really good job for us, and they're really receptive. In fact, even now, the hay grower meetings, if we have something that we need our state legislators, our federal legislators to know, Mm -hmm. we'll go ahead and contact Farm Bureau. Ah, okay. And I've actually had Farm Bureau call me and ask me what my needs are as a local chapter. Oh, that's awesome. (laughs) And I also know within Franklin County, we have uh, alfalfa growers that are on that Franklin County board. Can you help me tell a story and get it from a couple of different perspectives. I'm thinking about in 2015 when we had the port slowdown. What was the only association to take a trip to the ports and meet with the union guys? It was uh, your guys' group that went ahead and spearheaded that. Do you know of any other ag associations that went and met with the unions? I don't. Do you think that made a difference? You know, at the end of the day, when that one farmer asked, you know, you realize what problems it caused. And he answered, you know, you don't understand. These guys are a bunch of foreign ship operators and these guys aren't good people. Mm -hmm. And the farmer responded, you don't understand. You hurt me. You hurt an American farmer. I I would think that has to be in the back of that guy's head still today. You're talking about a farmer on the Northeast Washington Hay Growers Association, which in in the grand scheme of agriculture is of no consequence, meeting with union leaders that are negotiating over the operations of the ports and negotiating these contracts that we were talking about, right? Right. And to me, that was fairly strong comment. And it was really damaging to individual farmers. So this is, this is maybe a scenario where hay growers may, maybe made an a difference on the international scene, right? It, it, am I stretching to say that? You know, after he made that comment, John Paul, they actually started coming to hay grower meetings. They actually come and started coming to our state meetings. You know, I was, I, I'm fairly young and new into this, but I went to one of those meetings with the the union leaders. And at, at the Washington State Hay Growers Conference, and I was talking with one of the union leaders, and he had a lapel pin, and it was a fist with a cargo hook coming out of it. It's a union symbol, right, uh, from yep. the, the break bulk days, right? And I said to him, that reminds me of a hay hook. And he says, you know, it does too. I grew up on my grandpa's hay farm. And he took that uh, gold lapel pin off his collar, and he gave it to me. Awesome. And I thought that was, at, at worst, a damn fine gesture, and at best, kind of a, a meaningful peace offering. I really like to think that maybe that one hay growers tour has made a, a more of a lasting effect, because you're right, they have been participating with the Hay Growers Association, understanding that West Coast hay is a really big part of international shipping, because it affords a, a backhaul, if you will, for all those containers coming from China to the U.S., then they go back to China or Japan or South Korea, Taiwan, or a number of other countries loaded with hay. And it makes the economics of international shipping better. Previous to us going over to the port on that bus tour, 
we would get representatives from the port. The port would tell us how they're trying to improve the ports, but they have zero say in strikes. They have zero say in uh, negotiations between the unions and the shipping companies. And we had never seen a representative of the union until after that bus tour, and then they started coming to our our meetings. So what we have to do here is is break apart the Pacific Maritime Association. That's that's the, the the bad foreigners that the union guy was talking about. We have the ILWU, which is the union that operates all the West Coast ports. And then what you're talking about is the port authority that owns the facilities that the PMA and ILWU work in conjunction. And the contract I'm just making sure that I understand all of this because there's a complexity to this. That that contract is between the PMA and the ILWU. And the the port authority that owns the infrastructure doesn't have anything to do with it. Exactly right. Have we had anyone from the PMA yet? Not that I can remember. Okay. Hmm. I think they've been invited, but I don't know that they've ever come. Okay.